another mission which has a plan in that state. And why are you talking there? Uh, uh, so the title of my message is What Happens When You Pray? What Happens When You Pray? And one we're having the uh, past fellowship, and uh, it's about results of prayer. And uh, certain scriptures jumped out to me. Of course, I've seen them before. But the way they came out, I saw a different light to it. And it gave me a deeper understanding of prayer. I don't know about you. Sometimes when it's time to pray, sometimes it's like it becomes a ritual. Something you just do. Because you are meant to do it. Otherwise, God might be angry with you. You know, I thought not to be like that. It thought to be something that you you are pulled to do, you want to do. I think they're struggling with sound and that. Uh, it's something you want to be able to do, something you enjoy. Uh, and then when I saw from scriptures what happens in the realm of the spirit when we pray, it changed a lot of things for me. And I got a better understanding of prayer and prayer for me became easier. You know, the pressure was off and I wanted to pray. So I titled it, What Happens When You Pray? And what I saw was that, you see, on earth we pray. We kneel down, we stand up, we lie on our bed, whatever, we are walking, or we are talking words in prayer. Sometimes we are praying, meditating in our hearts, because the Bible also talks about the meditation of our hearts, which are acceptable to God in prayer. So the thoughts of our hearts also can be prayer. Prayer can be vocal, but prayer can also be unvocal. But that's on earth. But I believe the Lord just kind of opened my eyes to what happens in the realm of the Spirit when we pray. So in Re Revelation chapter 5, um, let's start from verse 1 so that we get the context. So this is hell. This is what's going on in hell. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the floor a scroll written inside and on the back, seated, I mean, sorry, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and to read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, and each having a harp and a golden and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. It was that last bit that just caught my attention, which are the prayers of the saints. So we are here praying to God. And yet in heaven, something dramatic, much more than our own prayers, was going on. And I see that as we pray, in the presence of God, you have God the Father, you have God the Son, Jesus, you have the, the, the four beasts and the 24 elders, you have angels, and our prayers seem to be collected. Seems to be collected. And, and then they are collected into bowls. <laughs> they are collected into bowls. And, and, and in those bowls, you have incense. 
and the incense, our prayers are mixed with the incense, which means when we just when we pray, it's not just a release of words. Those words go up to God's presence, and God begins to work with it. You understand what I'm saying? It begins to work with our prayers. So here he said that. In fact, before we go into that, if you back up a bit, let's even look at look at the presence of God. Let, let's pick up a few things there. Verse five. But one of the elders said to me, "Do not weep. Behold, the lion." Everybody say, "Lion." The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. So Jesus is described to us there as the lion, and he has prevailed. Because he has prevailed, he has the power to open the scrolls. Because he has prevailed, we can pray prevailing prayers. Because he has prevailed, in every situation that we come to, when we go to the one that has prevailed, it gives us the ability to prevail. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He has prevailed, and then the Bible says, to open the scroll. What does it mean to open the scroll? Opening the scroll means that he's revealing God's plan for the fullness of time. Opening the scroll means that he is executing God's plan for you and for me. So when we pray, we go to the one that has prevailed, and as we pray concerning what is written for you, concerning what God has predetermined for your life, he opens the scroll. He brings to manifestation, not just to reveal, but to execute to bring to manifestation that which has been purposed for you. Now, verse 5 says is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when you go to verse 6, is the same person is shown as the lamb. And I look and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and the, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Hold on. So, of course, this is talking about Jesus. The lamb that was slain, but is alive. Did you see that? Although slain, but now he's alive. So, it's shown as the lion, but it's also revealed as the lamb. The fact that the lamb was slain, but is living, shows that he has overcome. So God's purpose concealed throughout all the ages can now be revealed because this lamb is alive. So when you pray, your prayer comes into the presence. It is like there's a committee in heaven waiting on your prayers. So when your prayers come before God's presence, these are the things that happen that we do not see physically. But through the word of God, through the book of Revelation, we had an opening to what happens in heaven. Is somebody following this? So never ever think that your prayers are meaningless. Never ever think that your prayer is going nowhere. If you pray based upon the word of God, if you pray from your heart, God hears and God begins to take hold of your prayers. I want you to listen to this very carefully. Now, this might sound a bit boring and everything, and the enemy will try to steal this truth from you, but make sure that you are alert. You are alert to this. Make sure the person next to you is not sleeping and not looking, but just look to the corner of your eye. Just kind of tell them to make sure they catch this one. Alright, catch this truth. Amen. Okay. This lamb has seven horns, seven eyes, seven spirits. It has what? Seven horns, seven eyes, and seven spirits. The seven horns, horn in the Bible talks about power. Seven talks about perfection. So this lamb has perfect power. He is all powerful. 
in fact, is only potent. Do you understand that? So this God that our prayers are going before, this Lamb, Jesus, is omnipotent, has all power. Which means that when your prayers come before his presence, the power and the ability to do it is present. No wonder the Bible says, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Nothing. Nothing. If only we can believe. If only we can believe. I've seen certain people do amazing things in God much more than other people. The difference when, they, when you talk to them is faith. They dare to believe God. When you dare to believe God, He's happy. When we don't believe Him, in fact, the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Have you seen that in your Bible, Hebrews chapter 11? God loves to be believed. He loves it. He loves it. Your faith is never too big. If anything, it's probably too small. It's never too small. When you hang around certain people, they might tell you that you are dreaming and dreaming. Don't listen to them, you just go to God. If God has put something in your heart, the fact that no one has ever done it before is not a reason not to do it. The fact that no one has ever done it before is actually the reason why you need to bring God into it because with Him, nothing is impossible. All things are possible. When you trust God for that which He has put in your heart, He will make it happen. I think there's someone here today and you've been talking to some people about certain things and they just, they look at you like you are in a dreamland. I want to say to you by the word of God and by the spirit of God, that that which God has put inside of your heart to do shall be accomplished. Amen. For the lamb that has seven horns, the all-powerful, omnipresent God is on your side. He is more than able to bring it to manifestation. You just need to put your faith in him. Yeah. You just need to put your faith in this God. And he will help you through it. Yeah. I say he will help you through it. Yeah. So this lamp has seven months. All powerful, omnipotent. He is able. You know, we sing that song. He is able, more than able, to do what? Consent me today. He is able, to have two eyes in front of us. We can look forward, but we can't see behind and we can't see downwards at the same time. If we need to, we need to turn our head in whichever direction. But he can see everything at the same time. But not only that, he can see the minutest thing and the biggest thing. He's, why? Because he's the one that creates everything. He sees all things. He knows all things. He is all-knowing. He is omniscient. This lamp. He has seven eyes. So when the Bible begins to talk about these things, it's not to present 
a beast monster to us because some of us will be trying to imagine that this pain has seven months of it. Let's draw it seven months, two, three, four. Then seven eyes. Where do I put the eyes? Do I put them on top of the horns? Underneath the horns? Some at the back? No, 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 no. These are metaphors describing the nature, the person of Jesus Christ. Do you understand? So the seven eyes talk about the fact that he's all knowing. I am. And I, I totally like it when I come across the scripture that says he's able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. So even the ones I have not thought of is able to do it. I see another scripture that says that even before you pray that he has answered. Have you seen that before? Even before you pray, he knows the thoughts of our hearts. So when we pray, let's pray with confidence. Let's not pray like a beggarly person. Let's pray with confidence. Remember, let's pray with what? Confidence. Thank you. Let's pray with confidence. Because he knows all things. Sometimes when we come before God, we come like somebody who wants to present their case. In case he doesn't know. So we tell him the story. This is the reason. And, and this particular person, Lord, let me just tell you a bit about them. So they are like this, and they do this to me, and they do that, do that, do that, do that. Do that. Then, do. So we, 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 we lay it all out in case he misses out any bit. And while we are praying, remember some things that they do, we stop. We quickly remember, remind God about that one as well. He knows all things. He knows the details of every situation. Also, when we pray, sometimes we are trying to work out the answer. We think the answer ought to come this way. Therefore, we focus on this way and we tell God, okay, so this way, maybe it happen like this, like, can we really come through and tell God? But He knows all things. He, his, his, his mind is way beyond our mind. He said that the heavens are far from the earth. So are my ways above your ways. So we have to rely on the innumerable ways by which he can make it happen. Yes, we tell him what we know, but then we trust him to work it out his way. Sometimes, listen to this, sometimes God has worked it out in a certain way. But because that's not the way we are looking for, we miss it. Do you understand what I'm saying? For example, he sent the prophet Elijah. When there was, he was the one that caused the drought in the land. He prayed no rain. No rain means no water, no water in the ground, food cannot grow. There was famine. <laughs> so there was there was there was drought. And God sent him to a widow that was poor for his sustenance. Now, if you want to send provision to someone, chances are that's not the way you will do it. You will find a rich man in that circumstance that has stored up some stuff somewhere and is taking it out slowly to eat with his family. And then you send the prophet to that one and say, look, that one has provision. But God has innumerable, uncountable ways. We need to submit to his leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, it nudges us this way, it nudges us that way. Don't automatically shut down certain doors because it does not meet with your own thoughts. Rather, seek is this of God? Is God leading me through this? And if he is, stay there. It might not look great at the beginning, but if it is of God, you can be sure that in and through it, at the end of it, is provision. Am I speaking to somebody today? If it is of God. As a matter of fact, most things that are of God don't start with a one. Have you noticed? They don't start with a one. You always start small. And then it works with you. It works with you. It works with you. 
and he develops you. Wait, let me give you an example. He told the children of Israel, he was going to take them out of the land of bondage into a land that flows with milk and honey. So what were they looking for? Milk and honey. That's what they were told. Milk and honey. So they sent out spies to spy out the land. What did the, did the, did the, did the spies see? Did they see milk and honey? Uh -huh. They saw giants. Yes, that was the land that God had provided for them. Do you understand what I'm saying? But then, God, like we saw in the scripture that when the exhortation was being given, it teaches our hands to war. He's not looking for some weak, need, lily minded somebody that just a baby looking for milk and honey. He's looking is to grow his children, to mature you. So our work with God is as important as the result. The process of maturity in Christ is as important, if not even more important than the specific answer that we are asking for. Because it's in the process that we mature and grow as Christians. I've seen some people, some Christians, and you see them in the Bible as well, when the things just land on them, without process, without maturity, without discipline, they blow it up. We see the story of the prodigal son, as it's called. No maturity, no ability to handle the world, no wisdom to handle it. He took it anyway before time, and what happened? He wasted it. So God is interested in our maturity. Through that, he provides for us. Through that, he strengthens us. Through that, he lifts us up. Through that, we become matured Christians. And through that, we learn to handle the things that he's bringing to us. And the things that he's bringing to us don't handle us. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some people, the moment they get that which they are asking of God for, then they don't have time for God. Why? Because that same thing does not give them time for God. May you never get to the point where you don't have time for God. May you never get to the point where your family, your, your, your concern for your family takes you away from God. May you never get to the point where your business, your prosperity takes you away from God. In the name of Jesus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all other things will be added. After all said and done, it's still us and God. I say, after all said and done, it is you and God. You start in Christ, you must finish with Christ. Let nothing, let nothing pull you away. One of the signs of the end times is exactly that. Sometimes the enemy does not mind, the devil does not mind you getting some things as long as it will take you away from God. And I've seen too many people taken away from God, it drifts my heart. That will not be your portion in the name of Jesus. You will be rooted, you will stand firm in the mighty name of Jesus. So the third thing we see in verse 6 are seven spirits. Everybody say seven spirits. So this lamb has seven horns. We talked about power, perfect power, omnipotent. He can do all things. This lamb has seven eyes, which talks about perfect sight, vision. Illumination, understanding, perfect knowledge, is omniscient, he knows all things. And this lamb has seven spirits of God. Now, seven spirits are the ones that are mentioned in the book of Isaiah, the spirit of God. And that's talking about his presence. His presence. He is ever present by his spirit. His spirit is present at all time. He's omnipresent. So no matter where we are what we do, when we do it, we can be assured of God's presence. So, that is the nature of the God to whom our prayers come to. So, our prayers come before the throne of God, the elders are there, the four priests are there, God the Father is there, the Lamb, who is also the Lion that prevailed, is there, the Lamb slain but now alive is there, he is omnipotent, he is omniscient, he is omnipresent. Then verse 7, then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That was the God the Father. So he took the scroll. And when he had taken the scroll, 
the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a heart. So imagine this: in God's presence, there's worship going on, there's adoration going on. The twenty-four elders, each of them has golden bowls, and the bowls are full of incense. <laughs> Now, it, 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 there are still some churches, like the high churches, where, uh, and some other expressions of the body of Christ, where they have taken this literally. And what I mean by that is that, so when it's prayer time, they actually get incense and they do the incense. You know, they do incense. Uh, some will get candles because they think this has to be done literally. But what this is talking about, is that he says the incense are the prayers of the saints. So when we pray from here on earth, our prayers go through the realm beyond the physical and goes into the realm of the spirit, passing principalities and powers at the second heaven or whatever level of heavens that you have into God's presence. Nothing can stop your prayer except unbelief, goes into God's presence and the, 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 the prayers are taken and it, it changes form and it becomes incense. It becomes incense in God's presence. And the incense is presented in worship before God. It's like, which are the prayers of the saints? The incense are the prayers of the saints. And then, you are the saints, you and I are the saints. So when we pray, we go to work, we go to sleep. But heaven is working on that prayer. Heaven is taking that prayer and scrolls are being opened and worship is being presented before God and you are presented, your request, your petitions, your situation is presented before God. That which God has ordained concerning you, written in the scroll is opened and heaven is about to bring action upon your prayers. Is somebody getting this? It don't sound like you, but I go on anyway. Verse 8. Now, when you are taking the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each of them have a golden, golden bowl of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you are slain. That's talking about Jesus and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation verse 10 and you have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth so in heaven your prayer begins to affirm God's purpose power and authority in your life on earth. Do you understand that? And he affirms the fact that you and I have been made kings on earth. You and I have been made priests on earth. What do kings do? Kings rule, they reign. Kings issue decrees, they come to pass. Kings declare a thing. Kings have power. Kings have authority. Do you agree with me? So when we pray, the authority that we have through Christ Jesus is is like we are reminded of it. But what we then do after that is we exercise that authority. You do it in knowledge, you do it by faith, which is why when we make certain confessions, for example, prayer confessions, what we are saying is that we are kings and priests. We have been given authority. We, have, we pray to our God, to our Father. Heaven backs us up. Therefore, we stand here as the representatives of heaven and then we make these proclamations that is already written concerning us and concerning our situation. This scroll has been opened. Do you understand what is going on here? Okay. Also, Look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. I'm taking my time to read this now. 
Revelation 8. Again, let's start from verse 1. From verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God. And to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer. I want you to try and imagine. I know it's a bit difficult, but try and imagine. Just try, try. So there is heaven, there is God, the throne of God. There are angels there. In this case, seven. They were given seven trumpets. Verse 3. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. So there is an altar. Now, in the Old Testament, and you have the altar of incense, you have the, so an altar is a place where you make sacrifices. Alright? So there's fire burning underneath it, and it's got a little bit green, and then the animals that are brought for the sacrifice are placed on the altar. Sometimes they will sprinkle um, the blood of the animals on the altar. Uh, sometimes, you know, so all of that is going on. So there, there is an altar. And then he was given much incense. You see that word incense again? He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So again, we see that our prayers don't just stop here. Our prayers go before God's presence. And angels begin to walk and worship God with it. And stuff are happening in heaven. But the stuff happening in heaven do not stay there. Something else happens to those prayers. Verse 4. And the smoke of the incense, which is mixed with the prayers of the saints. Remember, if you are a born-again Christian, you are a saint. You know, which is why we don't pray to saints. Philip and Saint Peter, they are dead. Hallelujah. But Jesus is alive. So we pray to God in the name of Jesus. The dead can't help themselves. Don't pray to them. Pray to God the Father who is alive. In the name of Jesus, the Lion and the Lamb who is alive. And the smoke of the incense, which the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. So you pray. It goes into the hand of the angel. It mixes it with incense. And then it goes before God. That's fine. Then something happens. Then the angel took the censer, that's the one that's got the incense that's mixed with your prayers, and then he fills it with fire from the altar. He fills it with what? Fire from the altar. Now, the altar is where Jesus, the Lamb, was sacrificed. Everything that he was sacrificed for became available on that altar. Restoration, salvation, deliverance, healing, all of it right there, victory, overcoming ability and power. So when it takes that fire, the Bible said that Jesus is the one that baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So it takes the fire from the altar, meaning that the result of Jesus' sacrifice, he takes it. And then, he threw it to the earth. He threw it to the earth. So our prayers go this way, from earth to heaven. He gets into God's presence. Angelic activity begins to operate. And God begins to work on our prayers. Worship continues with our prayer. Based on our prayer, the will and purpose, callings and destinies of God for you and for me are unscrolled, which means God is about to do something. Do you understand what I'm saying? About to reveal and, and manifest yet another part of his purpose for your life. The angels take fire from the, from the altar and then they threw it onto the earth. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now I know that this scripture also talks about the end times and what will actually happen on earth during the end times. But it also gives us an insight into how prayer works. 
it gives us an insight into how prayer works. So which means from today, when you pray, I want you to imagine that this is not some meaningless, ineffectual, not going to happen thing. I'm not just praying because pastor says pray. I'm not praying because if I don't pray, I'll feel guilty. I'm not praying because it is my duty to pray. So out of duty and loyalty to God, let me just pray. I am praying because heaven is waiting on my prayer. I am praying because angels are waiting on my prayer. I am waiting because God is going to unscrew and reveal something about his purpose for my life through my prayer. I am praying because God is going to execute through these prayers his plan for my life, for my spouse, for my family, concerning my career, my ministry. That's why I pray. I pray because God is at work in those prayers. Have you come across a scripture that says that Jesus is at the right hand of God, forever making what? Intercessions for the saints. Praying. So when our prayers come up and all of this stuff is going on, Jesus joins in. Now, how awesome is it for Jesus to be praying for you? To be interceding for you. How powerful that prayer is. So when you pray, pray with confidence. Pray from a position of victory. Pray with faith. Pray with assurance that that which you pray and you are praying about, God hears. The Bible says that when you pray, believe that God hears. And if you know that God hears, then you know that you have the answer. Why? Because all these stuff are happening when you pray. You do the prayer by faith, God does the rest. You do the prayer by faith, God says, that's it, thank you, take the pattern. And he does the rest. So we see here a snapshot of what happens when God begins to do the rest. And then our prayers up to heaven is one way. Heaven responding back to us on earth is the second way. So it's like a return journey. That's why the Bible said that my, my words will not return to me God. It's a return journey. So when you pray, pray based upon the word of God. You understand? The, one of the best prayers to pray is the one that is based upon the word of God. Sometimes if you don't know how to pray, just open the Bible. The book of Psalms, some New Testament, and just pray, turn those things into prayer. Find the promises in the word of God concerning the area that you want to pray. Find it, then turn it to prayer. Take the word back to him. He is bound by his word. Do you understand? God is bound by his word. Refuse to entertain doubt and unbelief. Oh, of course it will come. It will come in bucket loads. Do you understand what I'm saying? Distraction, thoughts that the enemy will plant, try to plant in your mind to stop you and to slow you down will come. Excuses, justifications, all sorts of things. But when you pray, you pray focused. You pray determined. You pray based upon the word of God. Are you getting something in? Now I know this is slightly technical, but it's important that we understand this. So, why do we need to know what happens when we pray? Number one, it enables us to pray effectually. It enables us to pray effectually. The book of James chapter 5, that's why sometimes I say I don't like all this Mickey Mouse prayer. If you want to pray, pray. If you want to sleep, sleep. Enjoy both. <laughs> Enjoy your sleep. Sleep soundly. Then wake up and then pray properly. Do you understand what I'm saying? Pray. Pray with all of your heart. Even if it is five minutes, make, let heaven record those five minutes. Pray with focus. Pray with intent. Pray with passion. The Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 16. And we're going to pray shortly. And just before we pray, again, I want you to start thinking about the stuff you want to bring before God in prayer. 
and we're going to demonstrate a little bit of what we have just learned. James chapter 5 verse 16. If you can find the amplifier, that would be awesome. Confess your, pro um, your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The amplifier says, confess to one another, therefore your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins, don't cover it up. Why does he say that? Because in trying to cover it up, <laughs> Jesus said that the enemy comes and finds nothing in him. If you know that any of these things are there, just confess it before God. You know, get it out of the way, and then move on. And then pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Now, this is the bit we are going to. Look at the words that are chosen there. The earnest, everybody say earnest. earnest. Heartfelt. Earnest means heartfelt and continued. Alright? That's consistent. That's, you know, so which means that there are some prayers that are not heartfelt. How many people have prayed some non heartfelt prayers before? Don't lie, don't lie. You know. Okay? I've prayed some prayers that I'm just praying, my heart is not there. It is, I just realized what's going on. Why? I realize because my mind has traveled. I'm praying all right, but it has traveled. All right? It's, it's in a different place and thinking about some other things. But my, my mouth is moving. Words might even be coming out. My heart is not there. My heart is elsewhere. But this one, heartfelt. You bring your heart back. Uh, 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 stay, stay. Focus, man. Focus. I say, <laughs> I say focus. Sometimes it's okay to talk to yourself. Focus. And it says, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man. If you are born again, you are a righteous person. Alright? If you are not, according to the Bible, not me, you are not righteous. But of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. Not just power, but tremendous power. Which means great power is released by heartfelt, continued prayer. It also means not great power. What's the opposite of not great? Feeble, weak power is released with weak prayers. That is not heartfelt. He says this power is dynamic in its working. Dynamic. When those sort of prayers get before God's presence, no wonder he talks about thunders and lightnings and so on. Listen, there are some people, with, I don't know, maybe they've given up now, maybe in times past, that thought they could do you harm. Maybe they took your name to some places and schemed some things against you. You were not even aware. But thunders and lightnings were coming from heaven and scattering their schemes and their imaginations against you. All you did was you just prayed. You prayed, the angels took the prayer, they mixed it with incense, they turned it into incense, they worshiped God with it, they presented it to God, the scroll is opened, end of story. God takes over and stuff begins to come back to earth. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it has to be, so it's dynamic in its working. But your prayer must be heartfelt. You must connect the deep in you, must connect to the deep in God. That's why it's helpful to pray in the Spirit, to pray in the Holy Spirit. Because when you pray in the Spirit, your mind is unfruitful. Your mind is not involved. It bypasses your mind. So spirit to spirit, you know, you've seen some of those Plates that fly, and then they have on air refueling. Yeah. <laughs> All right, they don't even touch ground, and they refuel on, on, on flight. You know, that spirit to spirit flying. So you 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 work in the work of faith, but you are refueling as you are doing that. And there's a spirit to spirit connection as you pray. Dynamic in its working. The next verse, please. Now. This is the bit that challenges me. I pray it challenges you. Elijah, we all know the story of Elijah. He was a human being with a nature such as you have. I did not say that, the Bible says so. Now, what did Elijah that has the same nature as you do, what did he do? He said, 
it has the same, it has the same feelings, the same affections, the same constitution like you have, like I have. So this Elijah prayed earnestly for it not to rain. That has the same nature as you and I. When was the last time you prayed earnestly for it not to rain? Like Elijah that has the same nature as you did. When we were in Ghana last year and this year, last year we had a situation, you remember the testimony, when it was forecast that there was going to be a three day rain. During the period we were going to have the, the, the outrage. And on day one, it began to rain. Some of us held on to the, what do you call those things? Canopies, so that it would not be blown away while others were praying before, in the afternoon, before the first session. It was raining, and then it just stopped. Ten minutes away, where the hotel was located, it was raining cats and dogs, non-stop. Here, the rain stopped. It just stopped. I remember when I was going to get married. Oh, and by the way, and it did not rain the following two days, in spite of the weather forecast. Because we prayed. When I was going to get married, as we were going, I, I had prayed that there would be no rain around where the wedding was taking place. When I left my house in the camp, it was raining. And we got to a point where I can't, you know the sort of rain that you could almost throw a line. Yeah. We were, the car was wet and we just got past a particular point and it was dry. Like somebody drew a line and says rain, you just stop here. It was raining heavily this way and just here it was not raining. And for the rest of the few minutes to the wedding place, it was dry. These things are not in the Bible just for fun. But God is activating our faith to say, you have no idea how much power that resides on the inside of you. But I want to awaken you and trigger with the help of the Holy Spirit those powers that you carry in prayer. He said, he prayed earnestly for you not to rain, and no rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. Next verse. And then he prayed again after three years and six months, and the heavens supplied rain, and the land produced its crops as usual. He's a man with like passions, emotions like yourself. So, what emotions and passions do you have? He had it. Which means, actually, that we don't have an excuse. And that's why I don't like that scripture. Because God is saying, uh -uh. So, G, you've got no excuse. The power that I have available for you, you can do this. What situations are you calling on heaven to come upon today? For which you are demanding a change? What is it that has been written concerning you in the scriptures for which in the physical you see the opposite of it? And you are saying that scroll must be opened today. What has been written concerning me, I have seen it from the word of God. And today I am saying I want the manifestation of it. Stand to your feet, we're going to pray. We're going to pray effectual, like Elijah prayed. We're going to pray so that the deep in us we connect to the deep in God. We're going to pray in line with God's purpose and will for you. What has been written concerning you? We're going to pray to invite heaven into our earthly affairs. We're going to pray with knowledge, pray with God's word, pray, pray in the spirit, pray in faith, believe, expect it to happen. Pray with your spirit. Even if you don't speak in tongues, you can engage the spirited prayer. Spirited prayer is the time that Hannah prayed. When you pray and anybody looking at you knows something is going on. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's take a few moments to pray like that. Now, I want you to begin to focus on whatever those issues are and begin to talk to God right now. Just start praying. Start talking to God. Start talking to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we have seen from your word that when you pray, you receive our prayer.